recently. And this, this came out of actually, I stole the idea uh, from, I remember Cape Cod, and, uh, and which was mostly about Wellfleet. And I thought that uh, it is so simple to have people give their recollections of the town. And uh, we've done three of these so far, I think three. So this is the fourth one. This one I've targeted a little bit closer to uh, a subject, which is South Wellfleet. And I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, but it would be nice to get a few words from uh, the Wellfleet Historical Society before we get started. So I'm looking at uh, both Bill Carlson and Brad Williams. If one of them raises a hand, we could, if they want to say something, or I could just talk about what's been going on. Either of you, feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, it looks like Bill Carlson is. Well, I'm, cooking, um, I'm, I'm cooking rice at the moment, so I'll leave it to Bill. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, just a couple of things. Um, we were able to open the museum this summer, which was not uh, something we were sure would happen even until uh, mid springtime. So we did have a season at the museum, um, which will actually continue for a couple of more weeks. Um, most exciting of all, we were able to put together a special exhibit, uh, 1620, who was here, um, uh, which, which, was, which had as its uh, impetus the, uh, the realization that everyone around seemed to be doing something for the 400th anniversary of the pilgrims and then somebody piped up and reminded us that the pilgrims on their initial trip never even came into Wellfleet so what did they miss um, so that led us to re-examine our collection of Native American artifacts and we were able to get a grant that actually enabled us to work with a professional archaeologist and with uh, a Wampanoag historian, um, Linda Coombs. And the result is a small but somewhat um, well, well, very well researched and I, I hope a little bit provocative exhibit um, about the Wampanoags who were here in 1620 and showing off some of the artifacts that we actually have. So we're really happy about that. Um, the, the building project is continuing. The facade has been finished. We were happy to get um, a town vote on the um, latest, on the CPC grant. Uh, we have another grant from the Massachusetts Cultural Council. Um, so we have probably over $500,000 in hand to proceed with the second phase, which will largely be to make the um, interior of the first floor uh, renewable and renewed and usable and will improve the handicap access um, for the entire first floor. So um, in a nutshell, that's where we're at. Um, we're moving forward with several committees. They're meeting like crazy. Um, so, and you'll be hearing from us uh, probably uh, later in the fall and uh, again in the spring. We have a YouTube channel, actually. Um, so you can check us out on YouTube. There are several really interesting uh, YouTube videos. They're short, but they're, they're worth checking out. So uh, that's about it. Okay, thank you, Bill. Uh, the, and did you, um, the period garden, which is one of my, uh, favorite subjects is is also uh, on its way to coming back. So, so there's a there is a lot going on at the museum. Uh, we did have one sad thing happen this week, and that is that uh, John Connors, who is our vice president, is a vice president of the museum, uh, lost his wife just a few days ago, Kathy Connors, and she, um, you know, is 
had, had fought a battle with diabetes for a long time. And, uh, and so John just lost her this week. So um, if I could just ask people to keep uh, Kathy and John and the family in their prayers. Um, you know, very, very important people in Wellfleet. Thank you. Um, you know, we, we are all a part of history. And sometimes our memories are the only record of important people or events. So it's important that we pass our memories down by chronicling them. You know, and I hope that people put them in written form or as the Native Americans did long before we came here through oral history. And that's why telling your stories is so important. When looking back at our time in Wellfleet, you and I, the people we knew, the things we saw, and everything that we did, our memories are colored by the way we were connected to the town. Were you born here or were you drawn here? Were you a summer resident or a short time visitor? Was your life shaped by the town or did you bring your own version of reality and try to make the town conform to it? And is your memory surrounded by a halo or darkened by storm clouds? If you joined us tonight, I'd guess that it's the former. So my first question to everybody is, where is South Wellfleet? Oh. Anybody like to give us uh, an opinion? I'm, I will call on people. And the easiest thing for me to do is if you will um, raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand tools, which are in, if you go to the bottom of your computer screen in the participants section, if you click on participants, you will see something along the bottom that says raise hand. That is the easiest thing for me to do. If you're on a device and you kind of tap on the device, you'll see that as one of the options. Um, if you cannot do that, um, I can scroll through the, page, the couple of pages and try to see you raising your hand. I'm just letting you know which is the easiest for me. Um, you can also put information in the chat and I can read it out if you're not comfortable being on camera or you don't want to um, um, uh, talk. The first person that raised their hand is Russell Grieve. You can unmute yourself. That's you. No, I'm not Russell Grieve, you are. It's my <laughs> wife. Hi, Russell. <laughs> my wife, Carol. She says she was not born in Wellfleet, but she was her mother was pregnant in Wellfleet for summer residence on Wellfleet by the Sea, which is now Wellfleet by the Sea is an area. And the, the cottage. I'll tell go, the story. Go okay. ahead. Shoot. All right. The story about how go we ahead. got. Okay. All right. This is in 1929. Um, my grandfather lent somebody $50. And the collateral was a piece of sand. And um, the, uh, the lender, the, the, my grandfather really liked this, this piece of sand. And the, um, per, the person who, to whom he lent the $50 liked the money. So he lent another $50 for two little plots. And there we are right now in, in um, it's right next to the Crows and Cottages, um, Wealthy by the Sea. It looks like a Crows and Cottage. It's not. It's an old cottage that I get apparently was a, um, a hen coop that my grandfather brought down. And later on, his, his daughter married um, my father's, and his father was a carpenter, so he built on, you know, built on. So we've had that cottage since 1934, I guess. And now it's, of course, part of this National Seashore. So we're really very fortunate to have that. That's the story. Thank you. Thank you. So, so you, I can tell you're definitely in South Wellfleet. That's right. Um, but what, 
what do people consider the boundaries? We, we certainly know the boundary with the East Ham, but when does South Wellfleet become Wellfleet? I don't know. I've, there's a, I've looked recently, there's a North, there's a, let's see, South Wellfleet, and then a, there was a North um, Wellfleet thing and in the old, um, the blueprints, the, the, the old thing. So I don't, I don't know. We're on the edge of, I guess, of being in the North Wellfleet little um, blueprint area. I don't know. Do you know? Well, I've got I've got some ideas. I'm just wondering. I'm looking for the definitive. I was at the um, post office today, and I was using the post office as my proof that South Wellfleet exists. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if if you want to use O two six six three. I found out today that, that the boundaries of 02663 are the walls of the post office. That's what somebody just put in the chat. Yeah. So, so if, uh, if you step into the post office, you're in 02663. But if you step outside, everything to, to the post office is Wellfleet. But uh, I, I was talking to Fluff today down at South Wellfleet Post Office. Uh, and she, she was... Uh, grew up here and her boundary was the fire tower. Oh, so the, that's the, better. I like that better. So the, the fire tower would be, and, but that's one person's opinion. The fire tower is the boundary between South Wellfleet and Wellfleet. Does anyone have a different opinion? Lynn? Lynn Southey, you can um, unmute yourself. Lynn? Harvey Geiger, I'm gonna speak up. I believe it's where the railroad crossed Route 6 uh, uh, up by uh, Bay Sales Marine. Oh, so we're grabbing more land. So uh, can I talk now? Yes, you can go. All right. Um, my address at what is 1551 State Highway. I'm very close to the post office opposite um, PB's almost, near the dentist. And my zip code is 02667 physically. So, I, and I'm assuming all the properties around me are the same. So there isn't really a defined South Wales leak, is there? except for the post office. Well, only in our minds though. Okay. <laughs> Don? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Well, as a former town clerk, I can say that there is no legal town of South Wellfleet. That is just a postal area and uh, historically people said one delineation was Cove Road but just so people know there is no such town as South Wellfleet it's just a postal district. Bill? Yeah. Well, I, I've come to the conclusion that South Wellfleet is a state of mind. Um, it's not really a place. Um, it's kind of a, it's a self-definition. Um, it's kind of, it's more than, more than a little bit. It is an, it, it is an oppositional self-definition. Um, um, I mean, I remember when um, uh, Mrs. Davis was the postmistress in South Wellfleet, and um, when the South Wellfleet post office was a corner of the general store inside, and um, uh, she saved me bananas in 1946 because right after the war they were hard to get, and I really was fond of bananas in 1946. But um, South Wellfleet, when I was here in the summers, was always here, 
and Wellfleet was always somewhere else. And you, you went into Wellfleet, but you were in South Wellfleet. So um, I, I think it really is a state of mind more than a geographical place. Jeff? If we go back historically, there are, <clears throat> the uh, first congregational church was originally the meeting house and it was uh, more the village, if you will, uh, that was Billingsgate, changed its name to Wellfleet. Uh, and then at some later, some other period, uh, the folks down in East Ham allowed for the second congregational church to be built, which was down in South Wellfleet. So I think that was where the beginning of the distinction first appeared. And then I think the railroad institutionalized it when uh, there was a South Wellfleet station and a Wellfleet station. I don't have memories of either of those. <laughs> Another fact that should be known is back in the 70s, when it came time for elections, the voters list was Wellfleet and South Wellfleet. And historically, people would run with a faction from South Wellfleet. But there was no such town, <laughs> just an area of Wellfleet. Don, Don, you keep saying that and we'll, we'll just keep disagreeing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As Bill said, it's a state of mind. It, yeah. it is. <laughs> Car Carol? Um, I just want to say that having read some things uh, back to the 1700s, there always seemed to be some kind of a division because people referred to hither Wellfleet, which was South Wellfleet, and yonder Wellfleet, which was North Wellfleet. So it seems that even going back to the 1700s, there seemed to be this kind of division, although I do, I do feel with Bill that it's a, a mental state. People in South Wellfleet are, are very much attached to being in South Wellfleet. And uh, if you say they're from Wellfleet, they actually get upset with you. So I do believe in the mental uh, aspect of that very much, Bill. <laughs> but it's interesting that, that the mental division seems to go way, way back. And it may even go back to the time Wellfleet was incorporated and there were issues of, um, did, did you want to continue to belong to East Ham or did you want to join Wellfleet? And I think that's, some of the South people from South Wellfleet were more inclined to stay with East Ham, even though that didn't turn out to be the truth. But I, but I was always very interested in Hither and uh, Yonder Wellfleet. Thank you. It doesn't seem like anybody else has raised their hand for this. Okay. The, uh, you know, I had talked about people's, it, it, where you, came from, what your way that you focused on Wellfleet. And I, I have to admit, I'm a wash ashore from the 1970s. And my first opinions of the town were mixed. I didn't find scrub pines impressive. And I found sand in the shoes quite annoying. But uh, my future wife loved this place. And as I grew to love her, that, that uh, Wellfleet was part of the bargain. So I saw the Wellfleet through the eyes of youthful excitement, the beaches, the back roads, fishing in the ponds, floating on the waves, sharing a big inner tube, all created a mystical vision of Eden that has never faded. Uh, but one of the first things that became important too was if I was gonna be here all summer because I was a teacher, I had to work. So I went down to the general store the first year we were married. Arlene and I went down and saw Wally Houghton for the first time. It took about five minutes of conversation before we both had summer jobs. That was 1975. And, uh, and I worked for him for the next 20 years of summers. So, so uh, but before it was the South Wellfleet General Store that Wally had, it was Davis's store. I was talking with Eric Eastman this morning. Uh, he's 80 years old and he worked for Davis's pumping gas. And he remembers uh, Frank Fisher, 
who also used to pump gas, who was an old timer at that, uh, at th that time. So how many people remember Davis's before it was Wally's store? Uh, Russell, you have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Carol. Okay. Is that unmuted? Yep. Okay. I remember, I remember Mr. Davis with a, a cigar and I remember Mrs. Davis, she was behind the, the post office window then so yeah i do remember them and they lived up they lived on the top of the store right about they lived above the store yeah i remember them and i remember frankie every year we come down my mother would always say i wonder if frankie is still alive because he'd be sitting on a bench waiting to you know do the gas so that's my memories yeah i heard frankie used to uh fall asleep on that bench well, he probably did because there weren't a lot of people then <laughs> going by. He was old then. I don't know how old he was. He looked ancient, probably younger than me now, but. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, you know, it's really Wally that, uh that I remember, of course, because he's the one that hired me. And we had, it was actually three different parts of the business. There was the main store, then there was the Black Duck Bait Shop. And then between the main store and the Black Duck Bait Shop was the what we just considered the middle room, and which was my job, which was the summer, the summer business. But uh, when we first started, there were people that were Wally's brother, Ross, Delma Blakely, Glenn Rockwell, and as time went on, uh, Judy Tesson, Chuck Cole, Margaret Burdick, Nellie DePinto, Don DeRachi, you know, the, were the people that uh, I remember most from in the store. And in the middle room, after Wes Peters, who I worked for for a little while, after Wes Peters passed away and I took over running them, the summer goods part of it, um, I had people like Jeff Larson, Rory Eastman worked for me, uh, Little Link, who was actually Link and Amon's son, the, uh, the governor of Rhode Island's son, worked for us for a while. We called him Little Link because he was only six foot ten and a little over 300 pounds. And, uh, and my son Ethan even worked for me there. So, And then over in the bait shop, of course, we had... Uh, well, I worked one year in the bait shop, and I, I think it might be that I called Indian Neck Indian Head one day. And the next year I was working on bikes in the middle room. So, so, so maybe that's what changed that job for me. Um, uh, anybody else here that, <laughs> and if you lived in Wellfleet or South Wellfleet for a long time, you probably worked at the general store. I know you shopped there, but. Doug, Doug Franklin says that he pumped gas for Wally in the summer of 1970. Yeah, it, could anyone else pop, pipe in on uh, working at the general store? I'd like to hear some of Doug's stories because that was before I was there. Doug, you want to tell some of your stories? No? I'm giving people another minute because, I mean, Wally was, uh, Wally was an exceptional person because he, he knew how to make it work. He had something for everybody and so, something for every type of weather. So I did bikes and floats. So if it was sunny, I was selling ice. And especially during the, when the Canadians came down in late June, early July, and they wanted NAFTA and glacé. You know, we, we had to have ice and Coleman fuel for them because they were all camping. Uh, and we had 
rubber wraps, styrofoam surfboards that would last about a day and then people would come back and try to get their money back. Uh, we had umbrellas that would uh, break in windstorms. Uh, but then if it was a cloudy day, people would come and rent bikes. And if it was a rainy day, Wally always had all those little knickknacks in the general store that uh, people could buy, a few magazines, a few toys. Wally did uh, a little bit of everything. So he tried to catch people no matter what they did. We used to call it the store that time forgot because, uh, you know, it, it was a throwback. You know, it was old wooden floors that you had to sweep every night. And, uh, and we finally talked him into running a deli, but you know, before that it was, uh, it was pretty 19th century. <laughs> How many people shopped at South Wellfleet General Store? I see Christina there and I, th I thought maybe she would, uh, maybe add a few things. Christina just wrote a book, Second Home which is really seems to have taken off. She's been doing book tours all over, um, all over the country actually for it. But it's set uh, mostly in South Wildfleet. You'd recognize the places. And I think we've got her tied down that sometimes she's gonna actually come and do a whole Zoom just on the book. But maybe we'll give her a couple of minutes if she wants to talk about her experiences at the South Wildfleet General Store. Oh, well, I, um, thanks for doing this, by the way. Um, yeah, this is my book. Uh, um, it's called The Second Home. And uh, my grandparents lived on, on Drummer Cove um, and right just walking distance from the general store. And the book is largely set right in that area. And um, so we, I, I, my characters actually talk about the general store. And I, I don't know if you guys feel this, but I feel like a heartbreak whenever I go there and I see that it's closed. Um, it just, it's such a loss because when we were kids, I remember being barefoot in the general store and how sandy the floor was. And we would always get Mad Libs and, um, and the, what were the other ones? The invisible ink games that we'd play um, and donuts were, I think they were a quarter when we were there and my grandfather would always load up with lots of New York Times and, um, and the Boston Globe and we'd carry the newspapers home. And it was a big deal to go there because we weren't really allowed to cross Route 6 very much. So it was fun to write about the general store in my book and the, and the apothecary, the, the, or the, the, um, the, what do you call it? The, in, on the East Coast, the, the liquor store. Yeah. Package store. Packy. That's the word I was looking for. Um, so I wrote about that. And, uh, and it was, you know, one thing I just want to say is when I, there's a line in my book where one of the characters is driving the kids from the, the closer to Truro in Wellfleet, and she's driving them down Cape. And one of the, she says, that's where my family lives. And she points to the, the area where my grandparents' house was. Um, and an area that Lynn Southey knows really well. And the, and they, she said, and they said, oh, that's well, Wellfleet still? And she said, it's South Wellfleet. And they said, well, we just thought it was Wellfleet, Wellfleet, like that they had no idea. So I liked writing about the difference between the two places. And one other thing I, I just want to add, I, I thought it was really interesting that there, when we talk about the South Wellfleet and, and Wellfleet, Wellfleet, that a lot of my research was about the, cannons that they would shoot off on the 4th of July and that there would be cannon wars between South Wellfleet and, and Wellfleet and each year they would try to shoot off the cannon before the from what I understand before the like South Wellfleet would try to shoot it off before Wellfleet and it was a big war and then they the first cannon was destroyed when as a prank they put the wet sandbags in the back of the cannon and it exploded and um, then they hid the other cannon and that cannon was found in South Wellfleet, uh, right by Lynn Southey's house. And my grandfather was photographed the, the excavation of the cannon. Um, so I, I thought it was kind of cool that this part of South Wellfleet happened there. And um, there's amazing photos at the Historical Society 
documenting that. And there was an article, and if anyone can find it, I pay you money for it. I'm so I'm so sad I can I couldn't find it in all my research. But apparently, when Clarence Hicks, who used to own Lynn's house, had hid the cannon, he and his friends had a pact that if anyone broke the secret of who hid the cannon, that there would be a curse on them. And I, I remember reading this article when I was at my grandparents' house when I was a kid, and I can't find it. So if anyone knows about that, I'd love to hear it. But that's also my South Wellfleet memory. Lynn? Lynn. Unmute yourself. Hi, Lynn. Hi there. Um, I do have the article, I think. Um, it was in Yankee Magazine. Yes. And what I <laughs> oh. have to add is that um, I think they stole the cannons back and forth. And the one that was dug on my, up on my property is the one at Town Hall with a plaque you know, saying it's the Wellfleet Cannon. Old Charlie Payne that I used to bump into occasionally said, you know, that's actually the South Wellfleet Cannon. We blew up the Wellfleet Cannon. So that's just an interesting add-on. So. Yeah, I, I have, uh, when I do walking tours in town, I mentioned that that's the South Wellfleet Cannon because uh, it's about time for the young boys of South Wellfleet to get that back where it belongs. <laughs> <laughs> if it ever disappears, I know nothing about it. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, yeah. I think that that uh, story actually made two different issues of Yankee Magazine. More than one person. I think Myra Hicks might have been involved in one of the two, and. Uh, and Charlie was involved in the other. So it, it showed up twice in Yankee Magazine, once, okay. once before it was found and once after it was found. This one's got Miss Hicks in it. Yeah, Myra. Yes. How many people knew Myra? <laughs> I, uh, the, the museum, she used to write poetry. The museum's got uh, a lot of pieces of poetry. Uh, that she had written. If something was going on, she would just uh, put something together and celebrate people's birthdays or retirements. Oh, she was, but I remember her walking into the, she'd walk into the general store every day uh, with her dog. It was a whippet. And uh, she'd, she'd always show up at the general store uh, for her paper. Uh, we thought she was eccentric at the time till I understood that we're all eccentric in some way or another. Pat Bartlett, you have your hand up? Uh, well, I... You need to unmute your, yourself. I wanted to know what edition of Yankee that was that the article is in. Lynn? We The, the article I have says at the top, September 26, 1974, Chronicle 5. And it's called Cannon, Cannon, Who's Got the Cannon? <laughs> so 1974, and what's the, the month or the? September 26. September 26. Okay, thanks. Okay. I put it in the chat. Okay. So when we were uh, we were getting started today, Harvey started to tell us a story um, about Lieutenant Island. Harvey, you still there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my parents. Uh, we 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 came to Wellfleet originally in 1953 uh, because my uh, uncle. We had a home in Maine. And my uncle lived next door and he had a player piano. And my father thought that was a tough way to spend the weekend. So we came down and my mother used to stay with the Chachavatsis uh, in Wellfleet behind the fire tower. Uh, and she was the uh, uh, royalty from Russia and the adjacent property, which we then acquired and now is mostly conservation uh, is how we got there. 
but in 1956 or seven or eight, somewhere in there, my parents, we always went to the Cape for Thanksgiving. And uh, we had oysters in front of our home on the flats. And uh, my parents decided that they needed to have an oyster license uh, uh, to pick up the oysters, even though we owned the flats, which I felt was a little interesting. But at any rate, mom goes down on a Tuesday or Wednesday before Thanksgiving to get our oyster license. And she walks into the town hall and there's no one there. And she goes back into the selectman's office and there's an auction going on. And they're auctioning off the properties on Lieutenant's Island that were taken for uh, lack of, of tax being paid. Uh, and as uh, uh, we know from uh, uh, the, the, issue, the, the stories that Lieutenant's Island was developed uh, into small lots and many of them were in arrears for taxes. So the town took them and there was an auction and apparently everything had been sort of predetermined. Anyone who had a house on Lieutenant's Island uh, was able to buy their property for a very modest amount of money with no competitive bidding so that anyone who had a, where they were basically uh, uh, squatters and built a home, they would get their property. And then the, some of the uh, powers to be in Wallfleet, and there was always powers to be in Wallfleet, had decided pretty much who was gonna get the rest of it. And my mother walks in just looking for an oyster license and this auction is going on. And, and we looked over from our home to Lieutenant's Island and so mom started bidding on lots. And at the end of the auction, mother owned about a third of Lieutenant's Island, much to her surprise and everyone else's. And uh, then working with uh, uh, Luther Kroll uh, and uh, his office, uh, which they had some properties over there. Mother was able to put together various blocks. And uh, so we ended up being major stockholders or property owners on Lieutenant's Island and then sold off most of the lots for uh, uh, college tuition for myself and my sister. And then ultimately uh, we gave the first uh, lot uh, that we owned, my sister and I on Lieutenant's Island um, uh, to, to the uh, Wealthy Conservation Trust. And we were the first people who donated a lot to the trust before it was even a 501c3, so there was no tax, uh, but we wanted to start a tradition of giving property in Wealthy. And so that's our story. And that's uh, not only was that important, but because that huge area on Fox Island, that Fox Island walk that is just so great, uh, was something that Harvey donated as well. Um, who talked you into donating that, Harvey? Uh, actually, no one. Uh, <laughs> I, I have, uh, I've been lucky in my, my careers and my life. Uh, Pam and I've had no children. And, uh, and I decided years ago that we would give and help other people since we have no direct legacy to give our, our funds to. And so this was just part of our tradition. And uh, when we bought the property from, that we had uh, from the Durants, uh, my parents bought it in 1969 and they paid the outrageous amount of money of $60,000 for all of the Fox Island Preserve that's on the mainland that we gifted. And, uh, we always wanted to, to keep it um, in a natural state, even though I was a developer. Um, and uh, so that was just a way of giving back all the wonderful things we had at Wealthly. And, you know, growing up in Wealthly in the 50s was such a, a, a treat. The country club, uh, the sailing programs, uh, the, Wealthly had pondies with the kids there. Uh, most of the people in Wealthly who were summer people were educators. Uh, painters, writers, uh, and we were all there for the summer, and it was just, it's, it was absolute magic, and we're just so happy that we're able to, to give back to Wallfleet, and my sister's, uh, sister, my sister's children uh, are, are, have my mom's house, and my sister's house are still there, and uh, so we were just thrilled to be able to help Wallfleet and, and to give back without having to, to uh, get monetary. We want to give back motions. Now, now out on that Box Island property, and I, some people don't know where that is, I'm sure, um, but, but uh, check through the Wealthy Conservation Trust, the Box Island Walks. It's a, it's a beautiful place to walk, but uh, there was an old bathtub out there. Is there a story behind that? Or uh, Yes, um, I, 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 never, I never got into <laughs> being a hippie. Uh, but I always had the dream that I could live in 
in the woods in a forest. And um, oddly enough, that property, uh, Luther uh, Kroll's grandfather was the inventor of the paper bag or one of the inventors of the paper bag and was very prolific in inventions and also invented a lot of things to do with the printing and folding of newspapers. And they built a huge uh, estate on, on the property where my sister's house now is and parts of the foundation are still there. And, uh, and they had dug out the end of the, what's now called Whale Point, uh, Point, I guess. Uh, they dug out sand and when that house was built in uh, the early uh, 1900s, uh, they wanted to be able to go to the beach and the Blackfish Creek in there is muddy. So what they did is they excavated sand from that point where the bathtub is and they built a causeway over to Indian Neck and then with their horse-drawn carriages or walking, they could actually leave the, 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 the Kroll Mansion and go across to Indian Neck to have the ocean uh, or the bay beaches of, on Indian Neck to, as their, for their use. And so I thought it'd be wonderful to have a, a, a tub where I could fill it with water and we ran a hose from my office um, and let solar take care of it. And at the end of the day, I could go over and I could take off my clothes and I could be a, a regular hippie back in the 70s and uh, sit in the tub and enjoy myself. And, uh, you know, I never did it. And I also, I also have hammocks that I've always hung up for the summers. And because it was a wonderful th idea of laying in a hammock, and I've never done it. I still have a hammock where I am in Maine. Um, and then a few years after that, we had an employee who was intrigued with it. Um, and we actually built a little tent platform down there. And he put up a uh, oriental carpets and he built a, uh, a tent uh, and spent the summer there. And he enjoyed the, the tub and the, that lifestyle. And when we were uh, gifting the property and doing a bargain sale to the, for the point to the conservation trust, um, I decided that we would just leave it as, as a remnant or, or, or a memory of 50 years ago. Unfortunately, we, uh, it, it became a, an attractive nuisance that somebody might step into and get hurt. So I know where it is, um, but it, it, uh, you, you can't find it unless you know exactly where it is. It is still on the property. But, but no longer used as a tub. Okay. <laughs> I, now I noticed that Pam Tice is, uh, is here and Pam just has an incredible blog that she does uh, of all things South Wellfleet. I, I wonder if Pam has anything she'd like to say. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thanks, Dwight. Yeah, this has been fun. I've been taking notes to see if I have anything I haven't covered in my blog yet. And I also have a very long list of things I've never covered in my blog. So I have much work to do. I wanted to tell Christina that I really enjoyed her book. I read it just recently. And it was fun to read a novel and have so many characters going through and being in South Wellfleet. And the memories of the old house were so well done. Um, if you've ever been in an old house, you know the kinds of things you are confronted with. Um, if you have an old house. So uh, thank you for writing that and I hope there'll be more. Um, I started writing my blog because I wanted to leave something written for my own family about how we had settled over here on Prospect Hill. And I just kept expanding as I <laughs> found out more things and about more families. So I was gonna mention tonight um, it's really a memory of my parents and my aunt, my mother's sister, who were here in the 1920s and into the 1930s. And their memories were watching the Rum Runners that clearly there was activity over on the Old Wharf. And um, when I got to write about the Old Wharf, I was able to do some research and find out exactly which family it was that was um, getting the liquor. Um, delivered there and um, into a good size truck and um, taken up to either New Bedford or somewhere else, which is what would happen to the liquor that came in. And um, 
learned that the, you know, the back road that goes through East Tam is, was called the Rum Road at that point, which I still like to call it that to help us keep the memory of the Rum Runners in South Wellfleet. Thank you, Pam. Um, I'm going to so just jump what, in here for a second. Harvey Geiger again. I, uh, I've read all of Pam's stuff about or her, her blog on South Wellfleet, and she's generously offered to let me share it in writing to my uh, nieces uh, in our family. Uh, and one of the things she mentions is the bridge to Lieutenant's Island. And I was just reading this yesterday, and I guess that at one time they were going to put in a, a, a real bridge to Lieutenant's Island. And as I understand that the Army Corps of Engineers got involved because it was a waterway. And one of the traditions that I did for many years on New Year's Eve is we would sail at high tide over the road. Uh, and we did a circumnavigation of Lieutenant's Island. So I can confirm to the Army Corps of Engineers that it is a navigable passage. Yeah, and many a boat gets away from Blackfish Creek and floats over there during storms. So I, mean, I have personal experience on that one. Um, I see Gordon Spencer's there. Gordon, do you have any stories? I don't want to put anyone on the spot here. You'd have to, uh, Gordon, you'd have to unmute yourself. Unmute. Uh, okay, how's that? That's good. Are we good? Yes. I don't think I'm ready. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm ready for prime time here. I think you know a little bit about South Wildflate though. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, can you hear me at all? Yes, I hear you fine. Oh, okay, great. Uh, real quick, uh, the family first came to uh, Indian Neck back in uh, early, uh, the mid 1920s. And uh, still, my sister still has property out there uh, these many years later. And I was really curious. My wife asked me earlier this evening, she says, where is Salt Wellfleet? And after all these years, I honestly didn't know. I, I always thought we were part of Wellfleet, but it seemed like it was always referenced as uh, South Wellfleet. So I, I think I'm leaning towards the fire tower as the uh, uh, defining point of where Wellfleet ends and South Wellfleet begins. But to me, the interesting part is there's so many people that come to Cape Cod, come to Wellfleet, and they all have such a, a marvelous experiences, but they're always so different. And uh, as ours was, and my memories and my father's memories were just so much different than the folks that uh, I, I heard the uh, people who went out to the uh, Chiquisset uh, Country Club and enjoyed that. And we were a little different there. We never um, uh, schmoozed with the, uh, the hoity-toity, if you would. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, long and short of it, uh, my stories are many and varied, but I think I... I, I <laughs> on short notice here, I don't know that I can relate any other than uh, it's just a most enjoyable time to grow up on uh, in Wellfleet. It's a, so unique and such a great experience. Uh, but uh, uh, one one quick question, a thing I would add was uh, everybody mentioned working out at Davis's uh, uh, general store. My work experience was at the uh, finest. Uh, they were working with uh, Malcolm Murphy he, um, and, and my sole reason for working there was if you joined the union, they paid the highest wages around. And so I joined the uh, amalgamated meat cutters and butcher workmen of North America, and I was able to get a $1.72 an hour, I think it was, 
of course, out of that, we had to pay a union fee. But uh, anyway, I enjoyed the summers and I have so many memories there. I think I've got to sit down and write up what I can there to uh, pass along some of the unique uh, adventures we had. And I guess that's all I'm going to say about that. Yeah, it's, uh, we would really appreciate that, Gordon, to, uh, to put those memories down. The, I was just up talking to Peter Hall today up at the uh, up at VRs and a lot of people knew that before it was VRs and it was the South Fleet and Budge Hall was in charge. Uh, before that it was Julio's Island of Elba and even before that in the 1940s it was Ma Downers. Uh, any, anybody like to go to, <laughs> to or have been to any of those? over the years? I have Dave Lyons raising his hand. I'm not sure if it's about this. Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Uh, I just thought I'd, I'd ask uh, or, or tell about um, Earl Godwin and Luther Crowell, the story they told me about the Rum Runners, um, that that boathouse on the north side of the uh, of the uh, Lieutenant Island was where they would signal the people coming in that the authorities were waiting for them uh, if they happened to unload at uh, Old Wharf. And if the coast was clear, then they would uh, say it was okay. And uh, they told me, Earl Godwin and Luther, that it was uh, A&P trucks that were being loaded with liquor. So that's the little story that I had heard back in the in the 60s from the Earl, who of course was Luther Crowell's uh, partner at Cape Cod Realty. This is, this is in the 60s. Uh, and uh, so I just thought I'd add that. I, I think, you know, that little boathouse is still there. Uh, you know, it looks like it's about 10 by 10. The, uh, yeah, the, the boathouse is still there. And uh, the cost by the 70s, it changed from being rum running to uh, running bales of marijuana. I'm sure many of you remember uh, a ship coming up into Blackfish Creek by mis probably by mistake because it ran aground in, uh, in the shallow water of Blackfish Creek. So it was, uh, we had rum running and then that turned into bringing bales of marijuana into town. <laughs> so it, it's, it's, a, it's an entrepreneurial um, area. I can talk a little bit about that marijuana if you'd like. I would love to hear it. Uh, that was not by uh, mistake, but certainly by design. Um, the previous night, they had brought in a sailboat full of marijuana and it was offloaded um, at the old Must House. It was a cottage that was um, off of uh, one of the dirt roads on Cannon Hill Road. And it was a dirt road that went uh, past the Must House and out to a house that uh, Robin Downs McKay lived in at the time. Um, that happened on a Friday night, Saturday morning. And um, I came into work Saturday night for the Saturday night, Sunday morning overnight shift as a Wall Fleet officer. And um, there was a small index card on the uh, dispatch bulletin board that said that there was some unusual activity in the creek, a Blackfish Creek that evening, uh, the prior evening or early morning, and that we should just be aware of it. And um, so we made note of it. I was working with an officer who um, at the time lived off of uh, Old Wharf Road by the name of Davy Lewis, who I believe also at one point in time worked for Wally Houghton. And um, about 20 past four in the morning, we were at uh, uh, Marty Cunningham's store, uh, a gas station, uh, gassing up, and um, got a call for the must house, same thing. And that was uh, a code that we had worked out just simply to be able to um, have the dispatcher communicate to us that the same activity was going on in the creek as had occurred the night before. Um, you know, and nobody was really sure what it was the night before, but I knew it was a high moon tide and, um, you know, smuggling of marijuana was, uh, was a big deal back then. It wasn't like now where um, marijuana is legal and if you light a Marlboro, somebody looks at you like you had three heads. But at any rate, um, 
that was the start of a uh, of a of a enforcement action and an investigation that ended up we seized a 51 foot sailboat, a couple of smaller boats and vehicles, and um, um, was part of the reason why um, Cape Cod as a geographical area um, started uh, a program later, two or three years later, called the Cape Cod Drug Task Force, which was done to interdict uh, maritime smuggling. So um, basically it was the same as the rum runners, except the product was a little different. Oh, I'm glad you uh, joined us today, Parker. That's, that My helps. Question. You mentioned earlier too about the uh, general store. I'd like to know how many people remember getting a haircut upstairs in the general store. I saw Myron on there. Myron must remember that. But probably Harvey Geiger as well. Yeah, haircuts were never an issue with me, so. <laughs> well, there was a haircut, uh, a fellow by the name of Louis, um, was, a, was a fellow with a very thick German accent, ran a two-seat barbershop upstairs in the general store, and you had to go up the back stairs outside in order to get to the barbershop. And then eventually um, the general store complex itself was expanded and to the uh, south side of the post office is when they built um, the liquor store, who I think originally might've been Buddy Terrio. And to the right of that where the willow is now um, was actually a barbershop. Um, and eventually when he retired, I believe uh, Roger took over and that's when um, they had a barbershop up off of Aspinet Road. And then eventually Roger opened his place on um, off of Oak Road in East Ham. But that was uh, um, upstairs in Wally's you could get a haircut when I was a kid. Oh. Hi, this is Kate Sakarik. I just wanted to say something about the marijuana boat. Sure. Um, so I, I'm turning 50 years old this year. And I've been going to South Wellfleet, staying on um, Blackfish Creek since I was two. And I, we've been able to do that because of the Franklin family. And they've been so generous to um, let us rent for, you know, a certain time during the summer. And um, hi, Pam. And um, I was four years old when we woke up one very foggy morning and as kids, we used to run down in our bare feet down the path and it over into the front. And um, we saw, you know, all in the fog, this big boat and all these, these police officers, these state troopers with big, tall boots on, on the mud flat. And we watched for a few hours in the, in the fog while, you know, trying to figure out what on earth was going on but we were actually at Pam's cottage um, that summer while that was taking place. So that's my, I don't have as many um, recollections because I was pretty young, but most of my fondest and earliest memories are of South Wellfleet and especially up on um, Prospect Hill and right down in front there at Blackfish Creek. Thanks. Thank Early you. on during that, that initial call, um, Bill Brooks, retired Lieutenant Bill Brooks from the Wellfleet Police, was the officer in charge of the department at the time. And um, the call went into him to come out of his house and, and come and meet us, so we could explain to him what this was going on. We watched this for probably a good 35 or 40 minutes undetected. Um, and Bill was a little unsure as to what was going on. Um, although we were fairly sure, at, at any rate, he and um, another officer, Dick Palmer, went over to the Franklin property or off of Woolworth Road and trying to listen to, because you really couldn't see what was happening because of that thick fog, trying to listen to exactly what was going on. And other than the thud from the plastic um, wrapped marijuana bales, um, at one point in time, somebody said, we gotta move now, this tide is coming. We're, uh, is going, we're going to have a problem. And somebody said, just a few more minutes. So it was really, um, 
part of the way that they got caught was greed, I guess, <laughs> because had they had left when that navigator um, said, you know, he, he knew that the height of the, the tide was, um, you know, the tide had turned, the tide was going down, and he knew he had to get that boat out of there. And because they stayed those extra few minutes is why uh, it ended up being stuck in the mud. And it was interesting because somebody mentioned Link Allman earlier. Link at the time was an assistant U.S. attorney down in Providence. And we thought for a minute that we may have to contact him to get federal search warrants signed um, to be able to, uh, to look at um, some other houses and, and vehicles that were involved that were staying in other parts of the town that uh, um, turned out that we got state warrants for them. I'll just jump in here. Uh, my wife and I were sleeping in our, uh, where my office is on South Wellfleet off Baker Road. And I can remember huffing and puffing, a little Artie Parker came running by in the middle of the night asking if we seen any drug activity. <laughs> and uh, we, we thought that was really unique. And then if you all remember, uh, one of the Wilkinson uh, sons wrote a, a, a story about uh, Wellfleet police and, uh, and one of the chapters had to do with the Shango, I believe was the name of the boat. And uh, he was uh, a summer cop and was uh, watching for the, watching the boat when it was tied at the wealthy dock and it was in a payphone and probably went to sleep. And then he recorded that he, he, he woke up and the boat was missing and he thought it had been stolen on his uh, watch, but actually the tide had gone down. And so the boat that was in his view site before he went to sleep in the, in the telephone booth was now down, and, and so that was a wonderful part of his stories. Is a book wor worth finding if you can find it? Yeah, that book was written by Alex uh, called Midnight's A Year with the Wellfleet Police. That was about six or seven years before the Shango hobby, but uh, and it dealt with a different boat, I think a boat that was called The Mischief that was uh, used to, okay. I think maybe like in 73 or 4 that that occurred. And the Shango was in, uh, actually started on June 15th of uh, 79. So we're getting close to, to wrapping up here, and I'm, I think we could go on for a few hours more. I uh, didn't even talk about the, the clam shack, which was uh, right up the road. And uh, I know both my kids worked there at, at some point. Uh, those two pictures behind me over here uh, were, were uh, they had a little art gallery attached to the Clam Shack, those both came out. That's the uh, South Wellfleet General Store on the top. And on the bottom, it's a little bit more. It's got the Black Duck Bait Shop and also the Clam Shack. Uh, we didn't talk about Serena's and all the different places uh, that that was before it became Serena's. Nothing about the Wellfleet Drive-In. Maurice's just celebrated its 71st year. I uh, never got a chance to get uh, to talk about Maurice's or the Pond Hill School. Chuck was going to try to join us tonight, Chuck Cole, but uh, I, I didn't see him on there, so I couldn't have him talk about Pond Hill School. Uh, didn't talk about McGuire's Landing. To me, in South Wellfleet, there's one beach, that's McGuire's. There's one Bayside Beach, and that's the end of uh, Lieutenant Island. There's one pond, and that's Duck Pond. Shh, don't, uh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> and, uh, it, and that was when I was working at the general store, people would come up and ask where Duck Pond was, and uh, you know, I've never heard of it. Never heard of Duck Pond. Of course, that secret's long gone. And, uh, and then didn't get a chance to talk about, there's actually a piece of furniture in the White House that came from South Wellfleet. So if anybody ever wants to rewatch um, Jackie Kennedy giving you a tour of the White House, she mentioned South Wellfleet and a piece of furniture that was donated by a couple from South Wellfleet. So uh, all kinds of strange things that have gone on. We've had presidents through here and through Wellfleet as well. Uh, and so, and didn't even talk about South Wellfleet Cemetery and some of the important people that were there. Uh, I, any, any last comments before I wrap this up? Yes, I have one. 
uh, Dave Lyons, I just wanted to clarify when I said I was with Earl and, uh, and Luther, they were, of course, referring back to prohibition back in the 30, 40 years before. It wasn't, you know, in the 60s when that little boathouse was used. It was back during the, during the, uh, the time of uh, the uh, prohibition. So it was, it was many years before the 70s and the marijuana thing. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Any other comments before I wrap this up? I'd just like to uh, throw out that most of us don't know that uh, Nina Chatsavatsi and Paul Chatsavatsi uh, lived behind the uh, uh, fire tower uh, on the upper marsh of, of Blackfish Creek and, and her, their daughters, their granddaughters donated some property uh, to the Conservation Trust. She was the, grand, the daughter of the Grand Duke, one of the Grand Dukes of Russia and was fortunately uh, in England at the time uh, that her family was assassinated and she was brought up with Anastasia and uh, was the person who would be, everyone went to, to for all the pretenders. And they lived a wonderful, very quiet life, but part of the art community in Wallfleet uh, during the 40s and 50s and 60s and were a wonderful couple. And uh, it's just amazing to think that here we had the Grand Duke of Russia living in the backwaters of Wallfleet. And, and so many famous artists and writers and, and uh, you name it. So it's uh, that whatever drew us here or drew our parents if we were born here uh, certainly is attractive to all kinds of people. Uh, I really want to thank everybody for joining us today. This is an ongoing project. I remember uh, Wellfleet. It gives us a chance to uh, bring out stories that I learned so much tonight. It's, uh, it's incredible. We didn't even talk about oysters and I've got a dozen oysters that uh, have been out of the water for about two hours now. So before they get too old, I know I'm gonna go down and have some South Wellfleet oysters. And I, I wanna thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank Have you. a good night. Good night, everybody.